Appreciate everybody being here. We've got a good number. Got a few missing, but uh, a lot of you here. Good to hear Doug pray. Been missing him. Glad he's back, and hopefully things will keep improving for him. As I was thinking about this lesson, I got to thinking to myself, we've got about a dozen men that present Lord's Supper talks. That's pretty good for a congregation this size. And we've got uh, almost that many that go out and preach when called to other places. So we've been very blessed in that regard. And thank you for being with us today. The title, Logan asked me if I had a title, and basically this is it. Uh, the disciples' reaction to Jesus' news that he was going to die. And how he tries to prepare them for that fact. And we'll begin, uh, now, this is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of these first foretellings of his death are recorded in these particular scriptures. And I'd like to look at the first time he tells them that he's gonna, something's going to happen. There we look in Mark's account. This is right after that Peter has confessed that Jesus is the Christ. The disciples have seen Jesus feed 4,000. He has healed the blind. He has performed all of these miracles. And then he comes and tells them in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly. He wasn't speaking a parable. He wasn't speaking in any figurative language. This is a fact, he says. And we have the response of uh, one of his disciples. And this is Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And this is something that all of us face. What does God want us to do? What do we want to do that may be not in harmony with his will for us? Second occasion is in Luke's account. And we, we can look at any of these accounts, but we'll look in Luke chapter 9, just for a few moments, at this second time that Jesus tells them about his forthcoming death. In the ninth chapter of Luke, uh, beginning about verse 43, the, uh, the writer says, and again, this is after Jesus has been transfigured and he has healed a man or a boy with an unclean spirit. So all of these things he's doing show his wonderful power. And then he says, we have recorded here, but while they were all marveling at everything that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Sometimes we get news we don't want to hear. And he again, for the second time, he is telling them, that something is going to happen that they will not understand. And yet, they are afraid to ask him any more about this. He tells them that he will be delivered into the hands of men. In some translations, maybe the older ones have, he would be betrayed into the hands of men. He would be given over to another. He would be delivered up to one who had power. Now Jesus has power. We know that. We recognize that. But he is willing. He is willing to forego his power. In order that the will of the Father would be fulfilled. He'll be delivered up. Well how is that going to happen? 
is one of the questions that they might have been afraid to ask him. We know you, you've done all these wonderful things, and we know that there are people who don't like you, Jesus. We know there are people who have uh, argued with you, people who have uh, denied you, who have said you have a devil, that you're of Beelzebub, all of these things. We know that. But how can someone betray you? Now, the third time, and again, I'm going to go to Luke's account for this one, but it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 18, beginning about verse 31. And this is right after he has talked about the rich young ruler who went away sorrowful. And the disciples have wondered about how can anyone be saved? And he said, well, with men, it's impossible but it's not impossible with God. And then he took the 12, verse 31 of Luke chapter 18, and he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon and then they will flog him, and then they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, that they might not grasp what was said. He goes into detail, doesn't he? Exactly as the things will happen in the future, he says, this is the fulfillment of the prophets. All that they wrote about me must be fulfilled. One of the strongest arguments that was most convincing to me was the fulfillment of all prophecy. Even on the cross when he's dying, he is fulfilling scripture. But they didn't understand that. You know, something is veiled. Maybe you don't want to understand it. Maybe you don't want to accept it. Maybe that was part of what their reasoning was. How could this happen and why would it have to happen? He is perfectly capable of calling down legions of angels anytime anybody wanted to harm him. They'd seen him in the past when they had tried to stone him and he walked right through the crowd, it seems. It was concealed from them. They did not know the word. In other words, we use words, what's in our mind, the words come out of what's in our mind. And the words that came out of Jesus were in his mind, even from the beginning. He foreknew what would happen. But in a sense, these disciples at this time are about like Job. They don't know why. They can't fathom it. It just doesn't seem right. That one so good and perfect and sinless would have to suffer so much. It just doesn't seem right. They were greatly distressed. They were grieved. And they probably talked among themselves. And, and Peter was the spokesman, obviously. And what he said, they probably echoed his thoughts. Lord, it'll never happen. We can't let it happen. We will defend you. We will protect you. We will take up a sword if necessary to keep this from happening. We, uh, we go to John's gospel now because John may give us some answers to some of the dilemma that the disciples were in their mind trying to figure out. But if we go to the gospel of John, we notice that early in the gospel of John... Jesus tells them some things that later on they will begin to understand. John chapter 2, verse 18. This is after Jesus has cleansed the temple. And the disciples knew there was a verse of scripture that zeal for your house has consumed me. He was so passionate about what was being done in, in the Lord's house, in God's house, that he... 
He just had a righteous anger. <laughs> That's all you can say. It was a righteous anger. This is wrong. You can't be selling animals here. You can't be changing money here. This is a house of prayer. This is not a house of merchandise. How sad it is when we look around us at those that are oftentimes professing faith in Christ, and yet they have made merchandise of their faith. They want to profit materially from their supposed faith. But Jesus, in verse 18, we have, And the Jews said to him, What signs do you show us of these things? And Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Another glimpse that Jesus is saying, something's going to happen to me, but there's going to be a good end to it because I'm going to be raised up. This temple will be raised up in three days. In chapter 6 of John, he talks about the fact that he is the bread of heaven who has come down, and he will give his life just as the bread fed the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years, that manna. Jesus will give his life that we might be fed really eternally. But they didn't understand his saying that, he would eat, that they would eat the flesh of man and drink his blood. They didn't understand that. And many said, oh, you know, we don't want to be associated with this, and they walked away. But Peter recognized, and to his credit, you have the words of life. We don't understand it all. We may never understand it all. At least at that point they didn't. But he said we trust that these are the words of life. And we'll not leave you. In chapter 10 of John he goes on to say I am the good shepherd. And he says the good shepherd will give his life for the sheep. So. Again, Jesus, in the way that he presents things, is preparing them for something that will come about very soon. It will not be the will of men that will prevail. It will be the will of God that will prevail. In this John, again, chapter 11, we have a hint here. From Thomas, Lazarus is dead. News has reached Jesus. He delays his coming. And they might have thought, well, maybe it's because it's too dangerous to go where Lazarus lives. He's in Judea. And we know that... Uh, there are those who said they will stone him if he comes to Judea. There in chapter 11, verses uh, 7 and 8. Jesus says we're going. And Thomas is resigned to this fact there in verse 16. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. If this is his death wish, we're going to be with him. When he dies, because men want to kill him. And he is our friend, and we will stand with him, and we will die with him if necessary. That's the thought at this time. Now, in John chapter 12, Jesus makes another statement. The fact that <coughs> He is now very near to the time of his death. And he says there in verse 27 of John 12, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He is troubled. 
I wonder how long he was troubled, and I wonder what kind of troubled thoughts went through his mind. We, know, we do read a little more about this in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he says, the hour has come. I've been telling you. I've been trying to prepare you with these statements I have made to you very plainly. I am going to die. But he doesn't say, that's it. He says, I will be raised again. I will be raised on the third day. You know, sometimes it seemed like the women were a little bit ahead of the disciples, the men. We have an account there in John chapter 12 also of Jesus in Bethany. And it is Mary who comes and anoints Jesus' body with this very expensive fragrant perfume. And the disciples that don't understand this, and they think this is a waste, could have been given to the poor. It was expensive, very expensive. The kind that you would want to impress your girlfriend or your wife with, really expensive. Logan, <coughs> Logan's smiling here. He knows about that. But you know what Jesus says to her? And to those who were with him. He said. This she has done for the day of my burial. Mary. Seems to have grasped the fact. That he will die. And she has done what she can. She has done what she could. One of the beautiful passages of scripture. In the New Testament. She has done what she could. And. That's about all you can do, isn't it? <laughs> That's about all you can do is do what you can. Now, there is hope. And this is in John's gospel when Jesus in the last day when he's with his disciples. Just a few passages we look at. Uh, John 14, verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. Can you imagine a mother and father telling their children they, were, they knew they were about to die, but I have made provisions for you. <laughs> and there's some men and women who have had to do that. I'll not leave you orphans. I'll not leave you alone. I will come to you. Verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Or comforter, or advocate, or counselor. There are several different ways to translate this. I'll not leave you as orphans. John 14, verses 25 through 31, we'll not read it, but he says, Peace I leave with you. I'm going away, and I will come to you. You're going away, but yet you're going to come to me? How is that? Well, I'm going to leave, but my peace I'm going to leave with you. Peace of mind. If you can see through all of the terrible things that are going to happen, the end is going to be better than you ever imagined. But you've got to see it through. There's no going around it. It's got to be done the way the Father has said it has to be done. And then he assures them in chapter 16, verse 1 of John, I have said all of these things to you to keep you from falling away. Your impulse is going to be to run. And it was their impulse to run. You remember in the garden they fled. They fled. You're going to run. But you're not going to completely run away and you're not going to fall away. He gives the illustration of a mother giving birth. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. The agony, the pain. Now you'll have a child. And now you'll have the joy. And then in 17 verse 9 he says, I am praying for you. <laughs> that to me is so for important for them. For their confidence, for their assurance. I will pray for you. We know most of the story from there on, don't we? 
We know everything he said would come path, come to pass, come true. He would be crucified. He would die. And then, after this period of time, which he said would be three days, he does rise, just as he promised. But it was hard for them to believe because in their minds they are thinking as men, and men don't raise from the dead. They don't come from the dead. They had seen Lazarus, but yet... How could Jesus die and be raised from the dead? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The writer says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. <clears throat> Despising the shame. They crucified Jesus, and I believe he was crucified with no clothing on whatsoever. To make it all the more shameful. To those who were there watching. You remember they parted his garments and cast lots for him. Despising the shame. I tell you what, the, the, the shame that is talked about here. How could you even look upon him? He endured the cross. I don't know if Dutch will remember this, but uh, Tony Blevins, who some of you remember, Tony worked for me for years, and he became a Christian, and he came until he was no longer able to. But he went to Dutch. He had a tooth. Dutch said, I'll pull it. But he said, Dutch said, if you can stand or endure the pain for 10 seconds, we'll get it out. <laughs> Tony said, Yes. And I guess Dutch was a man of his word because he got it out in 10 seconds without any kind of numbing or anything else. Jesus was not numbed at all. <laughs> he, uh, he felt everything. He had to. And that's the hard part, part of the hard part. At least they would offer some relief, a little something to drink to some of those up there to help them with the pain, but not Jesus. He wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. He endured the shame of the cross. Now, we've come to the point where we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And you know, he instituted this before his death, didn't he? On the night of the Passover, of the night of his betrayal. <coughs> He said, here is the unleavened bread. My body will be broken for you. I will bear your sins in my body. That's what Peter later tells us. I, if they understood that then, I don't know. I'm going to do it, he said. And later on, for generation after generation, people will come and be thankful I did that. Not at that moment. Not understanding, but they will be thankful when they hear what I have done for them. They'll be glad that I would give my body, my sinless, perfect body, as the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that the Heavenly Father would say would be acceptable, <coughs> that I could forgive their sins. And he said they will also, they took of the cup, and he said this cup is the blood of of the covenant that I'm going to make. And this blood represents again the idea that the perfect sacrifice, blood will be poured out. And what can wash away my sins? And <laughs> with song we sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's why it was given, that it would help us. So we're reminded of this 2,000 years plus later. And we need to be thankful. And you know, one, the Holy Spirit came and guided these men in all truth. 
they could go out and tell the world what they had previously not known. And they would have a better understanding of how Jesus fulfilled the scripture and how he did something that no one else could ever do. And he opened the way, the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. And so we have that privilege this morning. So if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, and you are so grateful, we just have a time to remember what he did for us on our behalf. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we give thanks for the bread, we are reminded once again, Heavenly Father, that as the events unfold, that we who sometimes are blinded by our own preconceived thoughts help us to see clearly with eyes that are not veiled the truth that has been revealed to us in your word about you, your love for us, your son's love for us, and how with Father we can have the hope of eternal life of which we have just sung about. We pray, Father, you bless each one who partakes of it, that we might realize the cost of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We continue with our offering of thanks. Our Heavenly Father, the one who is the designer and planner, the one who foresaw our need, the one who looked around and said, there is no one I can send but my only begotten Son that can fulfill this responsibility or this heavy burden that is men have placed upon themselves because of their sins. And Jesus came and he gave all honor to the Father and submitted his will to the Father's will for our behalf. But now he is raised, he is risen, and he is at the right hand of the throne. And he has all power and authority, and may we submit ourselves to his authority. Thank you for the cup. Thank you that he was able to take this cup, even though he sought if it would be possible for the cup to pass from him. But help us to drink, Heavenly Father, in remembrance that he kept, he kept faith. And help us to keep our faith as we remember his sacrifice and the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 